Masih Chan ada si Ho Mas. Apa? Ada si Ho Mas. Siapa Seng Ho tuh mana ya? Seng Ho Kwan. Oh iya. Gak kelihatan ya. Ntar saya ambil makanan dulu ya. Ini ada konsumsi dikirimin dari apa nih? Ntar ya. Kayaknya ini kita admit all aja deh, soalnya Prof. Rosa kayaknya nggak bisa masuk waiting room katanya. Saya admit all semuanya, sudah jam 9, bismillahirrohmanirrohim. Ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, start our meet our event in this morning. Please welcome our moderator, Professor Eko Prasojo. Recording in progress. Halo, Mbak Devi. Halo, Prof. Eko. Please. Uh, we, could, we could start. Yep, it's uh, okay. 9.3, uh, so okay. start it. Okay, please, Prof. Eko. Thank you very much, Debbie. Okay. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Uh, and maybe good, good night in Europe, yeah? Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear honorable speakers and participants. Welcome to the Aqua virtual talk show with the team public communication amidst and post-pandemic COVID-19 leading to agile and adaptive uh, governance. It is an honor for me to be with you all as moderator in this Aqua virtual talk show. As we understand and experience almost 90 months, we have been living with COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah. This crisis will force the public institution to be more resilient and agile, meaning the capacity to deliver and enhance performance over time 
as well as capability to manage irregular and unpredictable changes. Crisis in other side will also stimulate for creating innovations and involve more actors in the country, working hand in hand with society to overcome the problems. Pandemic led to major change of policy development in sense of mass observation and data gathering to improve responses, real-time integration of policy expertise into policy development, but also new social problems. The government's capacity to handle with high complexity of many problems in the time of crisis will be examined, but also it will challenge to find a new working system in the public institutions. The normal process of policy development do not apply and no one has full competence in dealing with, with COVID crisis and perhaps other pandemics in the future. The public administration scholars and academicians has responsibility to rethinking, refining and also reformulating the focus of public administration study and practices in order to create resilience and agility of public institutions. Today, this ACPA virtual talk show will accommodate various ideas, perspectives, evaluations, and also lesson, lesson learned regarding various government efforts and role of public administration from several countries in Asia to overcome the COVID-19 pandemics. I welcome you, our honorable speakers and participants to this ACPA virtual talk show, uh, and especially our honorable speakers, Professor Agus Pramusinto, uh, Chair of Indonesian Civil Service, uh, Professor Cho Minyo, from the Sung Kyu Kwan University, South Korea, Professor Alec Brillante from the University of the Philippines, and Professor Ikuchi Masao from Meiji University. So first, maybe we could share the short bio of our speakers. Please, Mbak Devi. This is the short bio of Professor Agus Pramusinto. He is now the chairman of Indonesian Civil Service Commission, professor in public administration in the Gajaba University, adjunct associate professor, faculty of business, government, and law, University of Canberra. And he graduated from Australian University. Yeah. And then Professor Rosa Min Yocho is professor at the Graduate School of Governance, Sung Kyun Kwan University in Seoul, Korea. Prior to her appointment at SKKU, she was an assistant professor at Brown University in the Department of Education and Public Policy between 2006 and 2012. Next. Professor Alec Brillante is a professor and former dean of the National College of Public Administration and Governance, NCPEC, to the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Uh, his specialization include anti-corruption, comparative public administration, decentralization, uh, and also governance of institution and development. He graduated from uh, Hawaii University at Manoa for his uh, philosophy doctor and also uh, from the same university from uh, for the master degree. Yeah. He was also higher commissioner of uh, uh, commissioner of higher education in the Philippines. Next. Uh, Professor Masao Kikuchi is Professor of Public Policy and Management 
in the Department of Public Management, School of Business Administration at Meiji University in Tokyo, Japan. His recent interests include comparative local governance and crisis management in ASEAN region. Uh, he has published articles in Public Administration Review, Empowerment Policy, Governance, and others. So he also contributed chapters in and book of public administration in East Asia and so on. Uh, he has been serving uh, following position, yeah, Global Editorial Committee, International Review of Administrative Science, and, and so on. So. And last speakers, Professor, so uh, all speakers has been also introduced, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we uh, could start this talk show. So we have a second round of a question to be asked to the uh, speakers. Yeah, and then I will give you the opportunity to the participant to raise questions, comments, and feedback. Uh, and also will be uh, also uh, answered by uh, the speakers. So. Let's begin with the first uh, question to the speakers. What are the significant changes of public governance amid COVID-19 in sense of public service working in your specific countries? Maybe you could explain about the using of IT, uh, policy development process, agility of public service delivery, civil service reform, and also Relation, a relation between central and local governments. So, so maybe I would give you uh, opportunity to explain in five minutes. Start with uh, Professor Alex Brillante. Alex, please. Oh, well, th thank you, uh, uh, Professor Echo, and thank you for this opportunity to be part of this very important forum. As, as you mentioned, we'll try to be informal, and it's so good to see. Uh, our colleagues from around the region in public administration. Just a few minutes, uh, five minutes, but first and foremost, uh, the effect, at least to the Philippine bureaucracy, bureaucracy has been large, you know. All of us had to adjust to this quote unquote new normal. But let me say, it's not new normal because what we're saying before is, was there a normal before now? It was never normal. Why? Because even before the pandemic, things were not normal already. One thing, the pandemic, uh, one thing is that we've already talked about this. Noam Chomsky used to talk about the uh, existential threats to mankind. What are these? This include the threat of nuclear weapons, the, what we're experiencing now, climate change, and the pandemic, okay? And we should have addressed that even before. It was not normal before, okay? I must say that. So this thing called new normal is not really, for me, appropriate, okay? Number two. Uh, the bureaucracy has had to adjust to all these things, you know, within the context of work from home, within the context of coping with these uh, uh, changes. Of course, technology. We talk about technology. Okay, use technology. Uh, my professor, Echo, he told us to talk about technology. You know, it's very, very important that, yes, we've been talking about technology, that it should bridge. It should bridge, right? The digital divide. But even as we're talking about bridging the digital divide, you know what's happening? There are others that are even being left behind. So my point, dear friends, is that I guess since we're already more than a year into the pandemic, I think what, I will, what, we're, what we should really do here is to address real uh, the concerns that public administration should address. And okay, digital divide. Yes, let's bridge that. But hey, people are being left behind. In my own country, you know, we have rural areas that even don't have electricity. Globally, the Philippines itself has to cope with this. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to Korea, for instance. You're way up there and other countries are not. So we're talking about that. But the, the, the third one, after all, is it's very, very important that uh, the bureaucracy copes with this. And as you said, uh, Professor Echo, it should be an agile bureaucracy. People always talk about a vocal world, volatile, uncertain, complex, um, uh, and ambiguous, right? Volatile. But you know what? In public administration, I think I'll, I'll end being a little positive here. But you yeah. know what? We have to have the vision. Vision. How do we cope out? How do we get out of this? Understanding. Our job is to help understand this. And equally important, cl clarity. And what you just mentioned, uh, Professor Echo Agile. My point is we are in this together. But some are suffering more than others, as you know. In fact, just before the show, I, I was just watching TV. Even the United States are in such big problems today. No? Their hospitals are full. 
you know, we're talking about some people not being vaccinated. In my country, only 17% are vaccinated. Other countries, high vaccination. I think we all live what somebody called, in the, we all live in this so-called spaceship Earth. And it's Professor, really Professor yeah. Alex, yeah. can I interrupt? Yeah. Uh, what is the difference of process of policy development before and during the COVID-19? So, so uh, well, normal in normal time there is a yeah. very a normal process. Yeah. Now the policy development is very uh, fast. Yeah, to create and and so on. How is the situation in in Philippines? I'm sure you're familiar with Charles Lindblom's uh, muddling through. The, it's yeah. very, the science of muddling through that was written in the 50s but it continues not only in my country but all of us I think that that's really something that we have to cope with this incrementalism why because all of us we don't have appropriate information and that's what policy science that's what public administration is all about we make decisions based on complete information but guys we don't have enough information so we muddle through this that's why yeah. it's called incrementalism so it has affected all of us Uh, where before we can we try to look up to five, six, seven steps. Maybe there are so many things that hit us from the side and question: Do we have the appropriate technologies? Do we have the appropriate capacities? Of course, many of us work from home, and you and I know that's not exactly as productive as we do. And even in teaching, so yes, there's a lot. It, it has impacted all of us together, and we're in this together. So, what do we as as uh, professors and students of public administration? How do we cope with this? For me, the closest would be. Uh, in a positive way, muddling through incrementalism. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alex Brilante. Yeah? Now we are going to continue to ask Professor uh, Masao Kikuchi, how is the situation in Japan? What, what are the significant uh, changes during the COVID and maybe you, you predict after the COVID? Please, uh, Professor Masao Kikuchi. Thank you very much, Echo Professor Joe. Uh, uh, I just want to share just the two, uh, one slide uh, uh, to make it uh, shorter of my uh, talk. And uh, just want to answer uh, one uh, your basic question one by one. And before that, uh, uh, let me share the Japanese situation, current situation now. As you all may all know that Japan is the oldest country in terms of the average age of Japanese people, citizens. And uh, the ratio of the citizens with age 65 years or more accounts for more than 28% of all Jap population in Japan. That means in terms of the population structure, Japan is one of the most vulnerable country to any disease. Uh, yet, uh, probably uh, the, uh, uh, yet Japan will be, uh, uh, be evaluated as one of the, not just the most success, but one of the success country to deal with the COVID-19. It's a kind of strange success. And uh, that is the, the current situation. And the vaccination rate uh, as of uh, just today is, is just around 50%. One, so that uh, uh, just 50% of the whole citizen already got vaccination. And uh, how the bureaucracy works. And uh, last 19 months, what I saw is uh, uh, just maximum uh, mobilization in enduring battle. And uh, I, I, I don't see many changes the way they Uh, do a business so that, uh, that it found that uh, a very strong viscosity of traditional style of business. And uh, why? Because the use of IT, uh, there is a strange success without IT as it lacks the effective social security number system in Japan. Uh, let's say we did have a cash relief policy last year, but uh, to the, to the, the every citizen, but the mail application was sooner to get the cash than the online application. That happens. So based on this reflection, uh, Japanese government just this month uh, created new agency called Digital Agency to tackle the cross-cutting issue of digital transformation uh, of 
uh, in dealing, uh, not, not necessarily uh, confined to dealing with the COVID-19, but in dealing with the uh, many uh, policy uh, development of Japanese government. And the decision making process are still designed to find the, the better relations between policy makers and experts. The scientists uh, uh, tend to be more cautious unless we the, the, we cannot have unless we do, do not have the uh, scientific results. So that uh, there are kind of the, some battles between the policy makers want to uh, ease the restriction uh, uh, the earlier and the experts uh, uh, they are more cautious. And uh, we still have a lack of uh, EBPM, evidence-based policy making uh, uh, process. Uh, one example is that uh, most of Japanese, uh, the, uh, in currently uh, uh, in Japan, you cannot drink outside at the a bar. It's uh, drinking uh, in the bar is prohibited for last 19 months. But there, uh, uh, there is no uh, credible uh, the the, uh, the evidences how the drinking outside would increase the possibility or to get infected than uh, uh, than just having uh, dinner or just having a lunch without drink at the restaurants and central and the local relations. With the constitutional constraint, only governors can have authority to impose a policy measures with restriction of rights. But once the governors impose the, the very uh, policy measures uh, with restriction of the private rights, uh, they may have a, a possibility not to be elected in the next election. So governors are quite upset and they want to give give up their import authority and go back to the central government so that we see the kind of the, the, the decentralization. Also mm. the, from the other way, the, 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 the Japanese experience realized that decentralized or diverse style of IT uh, uh, investment. The system in one local government is quite different from the, uh, the same system in a different local government. Okay. So there's a kind of a, a, the, the, the uh, integration efforts. So through the IT integration among government, it, I see the kind of decentralization. So we had had a, a long effort of decentralization for the last two to three decades. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Kikuchi. Yeah? Maybe we could also uh, elaborate in a further uh, Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. I would like to give uh, Professor Cho opportunity to explain about the situation in Korea. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Echo. Thank you. It's um, Thank you. it's a great honor to be here to to share the experience of Korea with everyone. So um, actually, this is a long set of questions. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. So in terms, I think before I talk about what Korea, the Korean government efforts uh, related to COVID-19, I think it's important for us to remember in Korea's case, um, I think overall, overall, uh, there are weaknesses, but we are a country that showed agile adaptive governance in various ways. And we're, we're actually overcoming this crisis, I think better than most countries. But having said that, the reason behind our um, relative success is because of our previous failure during the 2015 MERS crisis. And during the MERS crisis, um, we were, I think, uh, aside from Saudi Arabia, the second highest, the second country that had the highest number of deaths uh, because of the MERS pan, uh, epidemic. So anyways, after the MERS, what happened was um, the government reformed itself in terms of upgrading the CDC, the Korean CDC. And we basically created the KCBC to have much more autonomy and to hire more professionals to deal with such kind of uh, disease disease rela related disasters. So having said that, um, related to how Korean bureaucracy and how Korea reformed itself during COVID. So first of all, um, Korean government, although we are known to have uh, really good digital governance, IT, um, still in the public sector, uh, a lot of um, education or you know, a lot of things were resistant toward accepting um, ICT. However, with COVID-19, we are noticing 
that that is no longer the case. So active use of teleworking uh, is observed, like the, the work of um, the, the non face to fake work system usage rate went up by 300 to 800%, depending on what we're talking about. Also, in terms of a public official training, uh, Korea used to prefer, to, to prefer offline collective settings in terms of educational training for public officials, but that has drastically changed due to COVID-19. And actually the Korean personnel management government is actually using this as an opportunity where now we're, we're in the process of creating a human resource and talent management open platform. Uh, this is an AI-based, very highly sophisticated platform, which will enable self-directed online learning for all government officials. And with that, um, there's going to be then a transformation of a paradigm, because before COVID, we used to have a centralized educational approach where, uh, you may be familiar, the National Human Resources Development Institute, the NIH, used to be in control of all training for government officials. Now we're actually aiming toward diversifying the role and responsibility of training where the NIH will provide the core values and common values, but each ministry, each agency will also have a chunk of peace and provide specialty uh, in areas that are related to um, their services. Finally, I also want to say um, things about uh, related to personnel management. Before Korean public administration used to value uh, things like stability, predictability, efficiency. But with COVID, like Echo said earlier, now timeliness and promptness is a, is a very, very important um, value that we cannot ignore. And so there's a lot of actually administrative, um, there have been some changes where uh, hiring, personnel management, leave of absence, compensation, you know, all these things are now kind of, there's a new kind of guideline set forth where basically a lot more flexibility is allowed, procedures are simplified, and manpower usage is maximized. And so we are seeing a lot of these things. And this is all based on a digital transformation where Korean government is actually trying to use COVID-19 as an opportunity because uh, last year, July of last year, the Korean Digital New Deal policy, it's a national level initiative aimed to lift the nation out of this pandemic. About 8.7 billion US dollars was invested into this. And basically what this is doing is we're allowing big data, AI, all these ICT technology to be utilized uh, in, a, in not only the public sector, but also in the private sector. And so the government is really boosting this. And we're actually seeing some results as we speak. So uh, I, I don't know, I, I wasn't checking the time. Is I think, oh, I think yeah. I'll stop here. Uh, I can answer questions. Okay. I think we have still one minute. Uh, oh, do I have one minute? <laughs> no, maybe you, you, could, you could explain about the coordination among the ministries in yes. the decision making process, yeah. Yes, so when we think about um, disaster management in Korea, I think it was interesting to hear Masao's um, presentation about how central and local governments, so a lot of things are decentralized in Japan. And so actually the local government is kind of wanting to give the responsibility back to the central government because they don't want to be accountable for all these decisions. For us, it's actually the opposite because especially okay. with disaster management, the central government basically has a lot of um, kind of control over uh, a lot of these policies. And so we're seeing some conflict between local governments and central government in the local not wanting to follow all these kind of guidelines. Uh, a very simple example is something like this, where the disaster relief fund, you know, giving people disaster relief fund, you know, is it going to be universal, how much, and all these decisions are kind of being controlled by the central government. But there are certain local governments that actually want to make their own policy, uh, and they want to create, for example, mm -hmm. they want to give out more generous funds. And this is kind of a conflict between local and um, regional and, and the central government. So we're having, I think, a little bit of a different issue here. Thank you very much. This is the opposite situation with Japan, yeah? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Recentralize uh, the authority to the central governments, but right. Korea, uh, the local authorities have still the, the, the uh, power yeah, to manage uh, the COVID. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rosa, for your explanation. I think we have to continue to uh, Pak Agus Pramusinto. Uh, maybe Great. you can explain the situation in Indonesia, Pak. Please. Thank you, Professor Raka and uh, Professor Kikuchi, Professor Rosa, and Alex, and all participants. Uh, let me start with the situation in Indonesia. Uh, as we know that 
uh, COVID began uh, our image in Wuhan, China in 2019, but the government, our government, just uh, realized and responded to it uh, in March 2020. Then uh, President Jokowi uh, announced that the virus had infected two Indonesian people. But then the government adopted a sort of uh, health protocols recommended by uh, World Health Organization. Uh, physical distancing and also the wearing of masks is mandatory in Indonesia. Uh, at the end of March 2020, the government then implemented what they call it uh, a large scale social restriction policy. The government will limit public transportation services and then 11 essential sectors are allowed to operate with limited capacity, such as health, food, and beverage, energy, and so on. And public uh, facilities during the social restriction policy were closed. Uh, recreational places, park, places of worship, education, and so on. And uh, this has uh, caused very significant changes in public services. So far, based on my observation, uh, there, uh, the response of the government is limited and uh, still short term. Yeah, for example, work arrangements, of course, has changed. They are made by dividing between those who work uh, from home and those who work uh, in the office. And consequently, the work system has changed from physical, physical meetings to online. And I uh, haven't seen uh, any systematic efforts to improve surfacing, uh, surfaces by digitizing or digitalizing surfaces for various type of surfaces. Moreover, and uh, there is no serious evaluation whether certain surfaces need to be changed or not. For example, for the health sector, there is no systematic effort to improve the surface system that is very crowded into a model of appointment so that patients do not hang around waiting in queues for hours. Another example with the delays in extending a driver license have to do with various written and practical tests. Why not just give a fine, but the money goes into the state's uh, treasury? Very simple. And I have not seen that uh, we have taken this pandemic as an opportunity at, to accelerate our reform to adopt e government. In fact, digital government and services are indeed an option that must be carried out, such as licensing, education, paying tax, managing identity cards, driving license, and other suit use technology. Just a simple example, people who pay uh, vehicle taxes do not need to come to government offices. They just uh, don't need to queue for long. They do not need to wait in crowds. Agus, maybe you could explain the relation between central and local governments. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, in terms of uh, regional autonomy and also central localization, I think this problem uh, now are questions. To what extent do regions uh, have the authority to make policy? Is it more effective in handling COVID-19 by giving the policy to the regions or should, we, or should the policy be in the hands of the central government while the regions only implement it? This is our homework that we have to study as public administration scholars. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Agus, uh, dear participants and speakers. I think uh, we have to continue with another question to the speakers. So the second question is, how is the stakeholder engagement or involvement, yeah, community, business, philanthropy, in handling with and also reducing economy and also uh, social impacts of COVID-19. So how is the involvement of the society, the stakeholders? 
in uh, ma in uh, managing COVID-19. So maybe we, we could start with uh, Rosa. Yes, Seko, yes. Um, so when I first got this question, um, I guess I was thinking uh, involvement of stakeholders. So this is, we can think of it in various ways. So first, I, the first part I wanna talk about emphasize in involving stakeholders in the context of Korea is the communication uh, the government had with its people overall. The overall public is a very important stakeholder when we're thinking about the COVID pandemic. So Korea's um, kind of communication with uh, uh, the public regarding, you know, all sorts of things regarding the number of deaths or the number of the inf infection rates or even just movement paths of uh, infected patients and, and whatnot. All these things were very openly um, kind of communicated with the people from the very beginning. Uh, and, and this is again, kind of learned from the exper experience from the MERS uh, problem where initially in 2015, when the MERS um, outbreak happened, the government was very afraid that people would panic and that this would create some chaos in society and lead to distrust. Uh, and so initially the government hid all this information and it, it, really, it led to public outcry and local governments started to get very upset. And so when COVID came out around, uh, the current government knew that that was not an option. Transparency had to be uh, given to the people. And so very effectively, um, I think communication was very transparent from the very beginning. Uh, another thing is the, uh, the government partnered with a lot of um, private IT companies to create apps, uh, information apps, and, and basically, in terms of all sorts of information, I think Korea's worry is not about transparency. It's more of, are we giving out too much information in, in the sacrifice of you know, um, privacy rights? So that's another uh, debate. But anyway, so, so in terms of um, communication and transparency, that's what we did. Now, re regarding uh, how much did we involve community members, businessmen, civil society in, in how we deal with COVID? Uh, I don't know if I would grade Korea Currently, right now, Korean um, COVID uh, regulations are um, related to the operating hours of restaurants and cafes. For example, you can't operate after 10 p.m. Also, the number of people who can dine together, uh, the number is restricted. And so these things are really hurtful to restaurants and, you know, you, as you can imagine, and, and tourism. And so... The self-employed, usually the self-employed businessmen and, and the community is really experiencing a downturn in their economic situation. And so that we're seeing a huge divide among people in Korea, economically and socially, because of these restrictions and how COVID is really hitting certain people harder than others. And so we're seeing strikes, we're seeing a lot of um, commotion, uh, and so, of course, this is a definitely a big issue. And so uh, involvement in terms of these individual, you know, different stakeholders, I, I don't know if we're doing such a great job, because like I said, our, our disaster management kind of uh, paradigm is like we have a central government, a control tower. And a lot of this is done very, very efficiently. And, and local governments and people have to kind of follow these guidelines. Now, interestingly enough, though, when we do surveys of Korean people and ask them, do you like kind of this approach where there's a control tower and mm -hmm. we have like, you know, the government shares all this information about individuals, like for the collective good, mm -hmm. in some sense, kind of sacrificing the individual rights of, you know, of our individuals. But overwhelmingly, a high percentage of people support this effort. Uh, and so that's, I think, the, what the Korean people want. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, uh, you know, there are uh, weaknesses to this approach. Yes. Uh, is there any social indigenous uh, wisdom in, in uh, South Korea where people could help each other yeah, in reducing the economic impact of the COVID? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I think we're... So, it, so you mean like individual kind of uh, non-governmental sector kind of helping each, each other out, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And also in Indonesia, we have a very traditional values, so-called gotong royong. Gotong royong means uh, help, help each other. So the, the neighbor or, or the, 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 the family that needs uh, maybe uh, food, we can also share our food to, to them, yeah, uh, in order to maybe uh, help them in, 
con con consumption, daily consumption, and, and so on. So. Um, I think maybe in, in the more rural areas, um, but currently right now in the urban kind of in the, in the city settings where the majority of population reside in Korea, I feel like these traditional values have, um, they're not as strong as they used to be maybe 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Okay. So we're, we're seeing, um, we're much more, I think now we're sharing westernized values yeah. more yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Korea is uh, more Western public administration now. It's getting Western. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you, Rasa. Uh, and I would like to continue to Alex. Maybe you could okay. explain the situation of uh, citizen employment in the COVID-19, uh, please. Yeah, very quick. Uh, one is, uh, I guess I'll segue from the earlier discussion. No, In the Philippines, we have what we call the IATF, Interagency Task Force. All the national government agencies and local governments and the business are all part of this. And the whole ideology of the IATF, Interagency Task Force, it's supposed to be national government-led, uh, national government-enabled, national government-enabled, local government-led, and people-centered, which goes now to your question. At the end of the day, it should really center on people. But even as we're moving in that direction, Echo, there have been problems uh, taking off from what uh, Masao and uh, Rosa mentioned, national-local relations. You know, national government is really supposed to provide the framework and local governments simply implement in accordance to. But there have been conflicts. Because in the Philippines today, we have one of the longest lockdown. Even today, uh, should it be lockdown? Should it be partial? It should be, you know, I have it. This is headline of today's papers, no? There's a lot of confusion going on right now. I don't know if you can see it. But this today, today, no? I, I, I decided to show this to show that should it be lockdown? Should we be open? Point to go back to what Rosa mentioned. Communication is important. People get confused. Should be open, should be not, because it's supposed to be the framework of the national government. Our new, uh, uh, I guess, governor of Metro Manila, his name is Benjamin Abalos, said, well, this decision on locking down should be, they call it granular, local. In that sense, okay, no one size fits all, okay? Including, of course, uh, the, the uh, part of, going to your question, uh, Echo, uh, helping others. National government has this program, which we call AYUDA. AYUDA is to give help to each other. So they have, the, and, and you know, it's down at the village level. But more important, uh, going to our traditional values, we have what we call community pantries, with or without government, even in my neighborhood. This was started by students from our university, you know, and it's all over the country now. Community pantries where people just bring their extra food and you go and get there. But the, the philosophy is get according to what you want. That don't get as much as you want. Even in my uh, our church, we have community pantries. So hopefully, or uh, it's, it's being done, uh, people-centered, people helping them with each other. You have Gotong Royong. We have what we call Bayanihan. Point, public administration, government is limited. It cannot do everything. People have to uh, take this up themselves. And so it's really supporting that. So yes, in accordance to our philosophy, indigenous, we have Bayanihan, uh, like your Gotong Royong. But the more important thing, to go back to what you mentioned earlier, the national government should provide the framework enabling framework. So I think that's about, uh, uh, okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, do you also involve, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the society actors? So in order to increase the awareness of the citizen oh. to use masks and uh, oh. uh, follow the rules of, uh, uh, procedure and, and so on. You know, just two things, Echo. At one point, as you know, the, the whole idea of addressing this COVID, social distancing, wearing masks, you know, we outdid ourselves. We just don't wear masks, we even wear face shields. And that's now sometimes where uh, purchases have, uh, have become some kind of an issue. No, this is supposed to be, supposed to be national government enabled. We purgations of corruption. That I think is the mm. elephant in the room here. That sometimes, you know, you have a lot of money out there given to one ministry and to another ministry to do the purchasing. So, uh, like I said, we have outdid ourselves and I don't know what the science is here. We just don't wear masks. We wear face shields. But because we have so many stockpiles of face shields because we bought a lot, as was their quote-unquote allegations of overpriced corruption, it's, it's all there. Point, dear friends, point, dear friends, is that is where now the private sector, that is where now the NGOs, civil society comes in and even other branches of government should come in, promoting accountability, promoting accountability. Sure, it's a crisis, 
We should have decisions made at the center, but at the same time, not forgetting the fundamental, fundamental principles of answerability, accountability. And these were our commission and audit commission and our, our other members of Congress. So again, like I said, it's a nice, 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 nice framework. But at the end of the day, when you, when you implement it, the people, the people should be involved, not only in Bayanihan, but also in promoting accountability. And in the Philippines today, it's very strange, not strange, but a unique situation because we'll be having elections next year. So that, that also somehow complicates the question at this point in time, like who are those getting involved? Is it because of political purposes and all? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, we are going to continue to Pagus. Pagus, okay. please explain the case of Indonesia in okay, thank you, uh, yeah. Prof. Eko. Uh, collabor collaborative works and uh, citizen engagement, of course, very important in handling or coping with uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, silo mentality is always a problem. And now we are challenged by this COVID. For example, managing one data is a serious problem in uh, in Indonesia. And without good data, I think our decision or our policy will be troubled. There is the problem uh, when we talk about how to distribute logistics to the people. We have to make sure whether the data is clear or not. And the second, uh, yeah, citizen engagement is uh, needed because uh, Government itself cannot do by uh, getting to the loan. We need help, and we can see that there are many uh, organizations or individual involved in uh, handling uh, COVID. For example, the uh, modern uh, Islamic organization like uh, Muhammadiyah, they spend or they contribute money to the government around one trillion rupees more than 1 trillion rupees. And the conservative uh, Islamic organization, Nadatul Alma, also mobilized people to be a volunteer. Uh, more than yeah, 1,000 people. Uh, they uh, work uh, as uh, ambulance drivers to pick to up uh, infected people or uh, distribute logistics and also assist in relocating uh, dead people. For a private company, we can see also they provide money, provide medical equipment, logistic for health workers, and also provide uh, oxygen gas. That's uh, what we can see in Indonesia. Of course, uh, by uh, learning from this COVID, uh, collaboration uh, is very important. Because, for example, uh, now the government has provided free vaccines. However, for the implementation, the government needs partners to accelerate. Uh, currently, uh, yeah, for example, uh, the contribution of universities police, army, and communities has been going well during the implementation of vaccines. The various stakeholders also provide facilities, uh, health workers, and also other officers so that the vaccination process uh, runs uh, quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Agus, yeah, for, for uh, explanation and comments. Yeah, I think the government could not uh, be working alone without the uh, society, yeah? without the business and, and other stakeholders uh, in the state. Yeah? So how is the situation in, in Japan, Professor Masao Kikuchi? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Eko Prasojo. Again, I want to share uh, just once another slide, uh, just to load down. This is just my memo. How the environment of stakeholders in Japan uh, even though the state of emergency was enacted by law and uh, Tokyo is currently under the state of emergency now, even now, 
that the most of the policy to prevent the spread of COVID-19 is based on the just request or instruction rather than orders, fines, or arrest. So uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, tried to impose some uh, punishment to the restaurants, uh, to the, which does not comply with the, uh, the drinking, uh, uh, ban of the drinking. So once what they do as a punishment is that uh, they identify the restaurant, they serve uh, the, the uh, alcohol, which uh, 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 does not comply uh, the, the instruction. What they, the government do is just to reveal the name of the restaurant, which may have uh, adverse effects. <laughs> uh, most of the audience may not to be a hard drinker, but uh, imagine that you are the hard drinker. Once you uh, you can get the name of the, uh, the restaurant, we can drink. Uh, you may go to that restaurant. So as such that, that uh, uh, Japanese experience with the pandemic is that uh, rather than the harsh restri uh, restriction, uh, but more like a soft approach. So probably the harsh restrictions are not necessarily answer to contain the virus uh, related to the uh, stakeholder involvement. So it is argued that this approach uh, grows up a modern tradition of the use of persuasion in state society relations, with what we call uh, or moral suasions, which is a, it's a Buddhist word, uh, which is a belief that states and various groups in society can first enlighten and then mobilize or persuade the citizen to behave in a desired way. In, in history, we had a, the national campaign for uh, restraint in buying up in oil shock in the late 1970s. We had also had a power saving campaign in 2011, uh, right after the Fukushima crisis. And the, and the stay home campaign uh, this time. So this kind of the uh, soft approach uh, we see uh, with the environment of stakeholder. The, the issue of legitimacy, uh, it, it is related to the issue of legitimacy. And uh, actually uh, about the, the political legitimacy of the policy uh, of the gov current government, we will have a general election uh, for the first time after after the COVID-19 uh, on uh, early, uh, in early November. So we will see how the, uh, the legitimacy uh, was the kind of the, uh, it's, it, it's going to be a kind of the trial for the, the current government in terms of legitimacy in the coming election. And in terms of civil service organization, uh, we uh, in Japan historically, we had had a lot of the natural disease uh, like an uh, earthquake or the uh, earthquake, typhoon, and the cetera. After that's not a, a huge uh, uh, natural disaster, many people rush, uh, citizen groups rush to the place to help the, uh, the victims as a volunteer. So we had had a tradition of such kind of the volunteer activity in natural disaster. But uh, uh, rather than uh, prior experiences of the volunteer activity in natural disaster, in this time, because you know, moving beyond, uh, moving uh, uh, in a different region is prohib uh, is not really prohibited, but uh, uh, not uh, you uh, not really control, but uh, uh, you are requested not to move beyond the region, so that uh, the. In terms of citizens' group activity, is a bit quite weak uh, uh, than the prior experiences. However, that because most of uh, people, especially in last year, uh, experiencing staying at home for uh, almost for two months, most of uh, people uh, realized or revisited the importance and the value of their local community. So they tend to uh, get involved more in the, uh, the activity in smaller community uh, based. 
And what uh, and connecting to the since because we have uh, Chair uh, Agus here, uh, uh, Chair of the Civil Indian Civil Service Commission. Uh, this year we see the uh, the growing number, a bigger number of the applicant to the local government officials. Uh, so many people want to serve uh, to the community to become a local civil servant. While uh, at the national level, the number of applicants to the national civil servant to, uh, to take a civil service, civil service exam uh, dropped. So that is, uh, that, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the very interesting observations uh, in terms of the stakeholder involvement uh, and related to the civil service exam. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masao San. Yeah? So the persuasion uh, relations between state and society and the issue of uh, legitimacy and then the, the capability is very interesting issue, yeah? Uh, I think Japanese uh, bureaucracy has rooted into the, uh, uh, for a long history, historical tradition, yeah? Uh, how the tradition of Confucianism and also the uh, so-called Reichstag uh, bureaucracy is very rooted in the Japanese bureaucracy. So now we are coming to the uh, third sessions. So I will give the participant opportunity to raise your idea and to share your experience. I think it doesn't have to be a questions, but you could also also give and also opinion about the impact of the pandemic to the study, uh, research, and practices of public administration in your country. So please, I would uh, invite you to give some uh, comments for the participants. Please raise your hand and speak. Alexander Ari, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity, Prof. Eko. Uh, my name is Alexander. I'm from the Indonesian FDA. So my concern is about the, because uh, Professor Rosa said about the CDC function. So I, maybe I will, I will to uh, elaborate about the FDA function because it, CDC and FDA is two important institutions uh, in this uh, pandemic handling. So uh, in Indonesia, uh, the... Especially uh, in January, when the uh, vaccine already uh, in the process to uh, issue the emergency use authorization, uh, public in Indonesia have uh, discussing because uh, when you issue in January, it's too fast or it's too slow. The public in or in Indonesia have a two different uh, a poll. So, so fifty percent uh, said that if you issued uh, in January, it's too fast. The clinical trial is uh, so uh, the safety. Uh, you may maybe forget the safety, but uh, or something. But in this uh, another side, the in FDA also said it's too slow because uh, public needs the the vaccine uh, very fast, very uh, urgently. So uh, I want to uh, maybe some of uh, in Philippines and Korea or Japan can give uh, the uh, insight about the situation about the public response or especially uh, how FDA. Uh, institution uh, act in this situation to be, uh, become a solution uh, uh, for this pandemic. Because in uh, I'm uh, just a graduate from uh, Professor Eko University um, uh, uh, via uh, University of Indonesia, uh, and my uh, thesis is about uh, citizen engagement about this uh, uh, emergency use utilization uh, authorization uh, issuance. So uh, I. Uh, analyze about uh, the uh, what a public give a response for the uh, function of the FDA so maybe uh, some of you can give me an insight about the uh, how FDA uh, act uh, in the uh, Philippines or in Japan or in uh, Korea especially because it's uh, the three country I think a very different uh, situation in uh, about the uh, pandemic handling it thank you thank you Alexander Ari uh, we are continuing to give the opportunity to the participant. Mbak Desi Ariati, please. 
Thank you, Prof. Eko, for the opportunity. I'm Desi from Faculty of Administrative Science. So nice to meet you all here. Uh, I have the short question. Uh, Prof. Kikuchi's explanation reminds me uh, about the Confucianism value that exists in Japan and also South Korea. Yeah? He explains about legitimacy, then uh, capability, for instance, and state-society relations and so on. And based on the fact uh, that uh, the number of uh, death in South Korea and Japan are low, uh, uh, can, we can compare uh, with other countries in Asia and also in other continents. Would we say that Confucianism here works better than liberal democracy, or we can call it a Western style democracy, especially when the country is in emergency, like uh, dealing with pandemic? So my question is for uh, Prof Kikuchi and Prof Rosa. Thank you very much, Prof. Eko. Thank you, Mbak Desi. Is there any questions from the participants? Please, uh, okay. There are so many questions in the chat box, yeah? So maybe I, I will uh, read the questions. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I look for another participants from another countries. Yeah. Ah, this is from Sekbeng Flores. Yeah. What is that? Maybe for Ferdinand from the Ferdinand Buscato. I have heard about the Japan Super Smart Society 5.0 wherein digital technology plays a crucial part. It involves the use of robots, IoT, and artificial intelligence. With this pandemic, does Japanese national government fast track its 5.0 development, or was it sideways to focus more on the pandemic? Can this be shared to other countries worldwide? And then from Carl Emmanuel Ruiz to Dr. Cho, may, may I ask what the difference of roles between the health ministry and CD, CDC is? Mm -hmm. How does the Korean government prevent overlapping of functions and interdepartmental rivalries? Thank you. Okay, uh, one more question from Ditri Andita. I read somewhere that the pandemic does not break the system. Instead, it exposes the broken system and that countries with poor governance are having harder times to bounce back compared to countries with better governance. What is your response to this statement? Does this apply to your country? Do you agree that in essence, nothing actually changes because of COVID? It's just the time, oh, sorry, it's just that the pandemic has forced us to strip off the illusions or that some governments are doing well when in fact they don't. Okay, I think we have a, uh, Five questions, comments, and also feedback. Uh, I would like to ask the speakers to give uh, comments and also answer. Please, Dr. Rosa, do you want to start? Please. Still mute, unmute. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, so a, bu a bunch of questions. Yeah. <laughs> if I miss something, please let me know. Um, okay. okay, so first of all, I think the question, uh, this, the easiest question to answer about Ministry of Health and Welfare versus the CDC. So before um, the MERS epidemic, uh, the CDC was actually a department within the Ministry of Health and Welfare. But after the MERS um, incident where, you know, it was considered a policy failure, there was a, um, a workforce that went in to evaluate why 
why we so, you know, why public administration failed so critically. And after this evaluation, which was in 2016, after the 2015 MERS uh, epidemic, um, they realized that the CDC should be independent, that autonomy should be given from the ministry, uh, and, and a lot more professional um, um, capacity should be strengthened. And that's a result of, and so as a result, the Korean CDC now is a deputy ministerial level agency. It's independent from the Ministry of Wealth, Welfare and Health. And as, as a result, it's much more effective. Now, the, a lot of the regulations and the COVID-19 policies are actually provided by um, expert advice from the CDC. And because the CDC is considered um, scientific, uh, very professional, uh, and it's independent from political kind of um, sway, uh, the public trust towards CDC recommendations are very high in Korea. And that was very important uh, in encouraging people to follow uh, these regulations because uh, Korea is really good at managing COVID-19, not just because the government did well, but because people were following these regulations very well. Now, this actually relates to the second, another question about the Confucianist values where, you know, Korea and Japan and, and a lot of East Asia have Confucianist values. Confucianism is a very complex um, ideology. So, so, but among it, I think the things that apply to the Korean case about COVID is um, Confucianism emphasizes harmony about people being considered to others, putting others first, like collectivist values. And that was very important for, um, for Korean uh, I think case because uh, uh, when these regulations kicked in and when people were asked to you know wear masks and you know kind of follow these uh, somewhat uncomfortable regulations, they did so because people uh, were putting the collect collectivist value first. And so I think uh, e it was easier for um, the Korean government because we had these uh, innate values instilled in us. Um, I think another question was about. Um, you know, how FDA Korea uh, approved vaccinations um, as opposed to CDC functions. So in the Korea um, FDA kind of approval for vaccinations, definitely it was expedited. Um, and this type of expedite, expediting kind of these regulations or these um, approval processes is not limited to the FDA. So like I said earlier, uh, in personnel management, we had to hire a lot more health professionals, a lot more public officials to deal with COVID-19. And usually in government, when we need to hire additional um, workers, uh, you have to change the rules. Uh, basically, there's, there are rules for the set number of people you can hire. And so there was a lot of red tape and bureaucracy in actually hiring additional um, personnel. Now, during COVID-19, we lifted that. And so basically there was um, an exception where ministries and agencies were directly related to COVID-19 um, work were able to hire without having to go through this long process. So again, it was expedited. So this type of, that's why I said, I think Korean government showed a lot of agile adaptive governance in dealing with this epidemic. Um, and it wasn't limited to just the health sector. It was actually uh, broad in, in, in various areas of public administration. I think I answered most of the questions. <laughs> Rosa, could you please explain uh, what is the government agencies has the responsibility to approve the vaccines in, in Korea? Yes, so we have an FDA. Again, this is a deputy ministerial level agency. This is, again, an independent autonomous agency. And if you look at the history of the F Korean FDA, it was also part of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. But again, we, um, the Korean government realized that again, FDA needs to be independent because they're making a lot of important decisions and we don't want any influence, undue influence. So again, that was, we made it into, it was upgraded to a ministerial level independent agency and it was autonomous, now it's autonomous. And so the expedition, this decision was again made by that independent agency. Of course, of course the government and, you know, and the president and everyone is kind of giving opinions, but again, we have a separate agency for these things. Okay. Yeah. But FDA is very independent yeah, in sense of to uh, approve yes. uh, simple vaccines. Yeah. Yes, yes. The okay. FDA, I'm not sure exactly when the FDA became independent from the Ministry of Health, but this was way before COVID-19. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Rosa, for your answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, could you answer the questions or, or comments from the participants? Well, uh, you mentioned about, I, I think that's a very sharp question about somebody said that uh, uh, 
it, it actually exposes a broken system. And yes. that's precisely what public administration is all about. That's precisely what the bureaucracy is all about. We're just so concerned about doing things over and over because it provides stability and continuity. Now, something comes in, a so-called black swan, which I don't necessarily agree with because there are those who really have anticipated this. And sometimes we are caught off guard. You know, in the Philippines, we had one senator in some time back uh, who actually proposed a bill uh, uh, that would have addressed this pandemic. Her name is Senator Miriam Santiago. The point is, there have been thinking, there have been those who already thought about this. Like I said, even Noam Chomsky talked about this. Apparently, it's the bureaucracy that did not respond to this. And that's precisely about this. The inability, that the question, the inability of the bureaucracy to respond, which is part of what she said about, it just, it just uh, reveals the brokenness of our bureaucracy. That is why uh, one, one term everybody talks about the importance of agility in bureaucracy. That is so true. But question, how agile are we? But the more important question, there are also what I would call questions behind the question. Do we have enough resources? But the, sometimes the elephant in the room in the Philippines, well, let's talk about that, intergovernmental relations, the share between national and local, who will give up power, but equally important accountabilities. This is also opportunity for corruption. I've seen this, allegations of corruption at the national level and down to the village level. We have what we call uh, ayuda or giving help. And we have villagers, we have village captains who actually uh, steal the money from them. That's at the lo lowest level. This whole notion of corruption. That's why I go back and I think I'm glad we're, we're talking about this, about maybe it's at the level of the individual, the value level, which I think is emerging in our discussion today. You're talking about the role of uh, shared responsibility. My colleague talked about the importance of shared responsibility. We're talking about shared accountability. You're talking about Gotong Royong. You know, it's us together. It can be, you know, yeah. and unfortunately it just comes out because of opportunities for corruption. Because, and that, that's also at the individual level. And that's something I think that we in public administration should address. How do we change the mindsets of people in government or even the people or our ordinary people? Because sometimes people, I'll shut up after this. People sometimes say, oh, it's the role of government. Hey, it's shared responsibility. You cannot leave everything to government alone because it will surely fail. We are in this together. So how do you change the mindsets of the people to really do things and equally important how to, I guess, uh, bring out that uh, notion of public service in our, in our public service, that you're a public official. The whole notion of changing our mindsets, not only government, but even our people themselves. And that I think is what it's exposed about, you know, uh, exposing the, the brokenness of the system. Sorry, I know my internet is not so good this time. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Masao, this, uh, there is a question to you, I think, uh, yeah. from Ferdinand, yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I have received uh, a couple of questions. And uh, in terms of the Confucianism, impact of Confucianism, and uh, together with Korea and Taiwan and uh, in China, yes, and the kind of the group uh, orientation uh, to give more importance on the collective value, would of course because that uh, the most of the policy measure to uh, towards the uh, the COVID nineteen is uh, to apply to not to individual but uh, to the, the society at large. So that uh, uh, yeah, it, the Confucians may have uh, uh, the uh, the certain impact influences as a kind of the uh, the foundation of the society of the effectiveness of the policy, uh, uh, both uh, among you know, Korea, Taiwan, China, and Japan. But uh, uh, personally, that, uh, uh, but uh, the stress, uh, the, the kind of the uh, importance of the Confucianism uh, mm -hmm. that may uh, lead to kind of the separation of the individual freedom. So that, uh, of course, they attract we had a kind of a traditional value of the Confucian is exist as a kind of foundation and that may contribute to the uh, effectiveness of the policy measures. But uh, 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 I don't want to stress uh, that, that the Confucian is important. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is just a traditional value. And another uh, interesting question, although uh, Korea and Japan is 
it classifies under the Confucian group. But the, what are the differences? As the Lothar's observation is the uh, more decentralization, and while my observation in, in Japan here is kind of the toward decentralization, and uh, probably because the, there would be a, what happened is the kind of the brain avoidance game between central government and local government. Governors, uh, they used to be uh, they they identify themselves as a kind of a service provider of a lot of the, the, the local public service to the, the citizens. And what they are not familiar with to formulate and implement the policy uh, to impose the restriction of the individual freedom. So they are kind of the, uh, the uh, they, uh, are not really familiar with such kind of the, the, the authority, authoritative uh, the policy measures. While of course the central government, uh, so that's why that want to uh, give up their responsibility to avoid the blame because the ones uh, he or she failed, uh, they, uh, they he or she may be lost in the next election so that uh, why uh, uh, that will be uh, one uh, possible explanations and so society uh, 5.0 again as I told you before in my first round of the talk that uh, Japanese success was unfortunately in my observation is without society 5.0 and uh, more kind of manual work. And but uh, uh, gradually, because this COVID pandemic, uh, we already had uh, more than 19 months. Gradually, Japanese government like to employ the, uh, the lot of the uh, ICT technologies, uh, for instance, to avoid the contact with the uh, the, the patient. They use the robot and uh, provide the needles and uh, and the necessary uh, drugs and etc. So, and uh, that's why that, uh, the, uh, that the Japanese government uh, created digital agency to boost up to the utilize uh, uh, the uh, utilized uh, uh, the, the DX to uh, realize the IC uh, society 5.0 uh, even under pandemic. But in the long run, even uh, without uh, this pandemic, society 5.0 is kind of, uh, for me, it's a, it's a destiny or the necessary, because in Japan, uh, we, uh, as I told you before in the beginning, uh, Japanese society is becoming the all super aged society with the deep population to, to increase the, uh, the productivity both uh, Japanese society and government, we really need to have a transformation of to achieve society 5.0 to keep the competitiveness of the nations among uh, uh, in the global uh, competition. I think I answered most of the questions. Echo, can I just ask a very quick question? Yes, please, know. please. No, because we're talking ICT. Sometimes we live in different worlds. Japan, Korea, hey, you guys are way ahead. But in countries such as ours, we talk about ICT. And that, that, that's a point I mentioned earlier about the so-called digital divide. You're talking digitalization, digitization, etc. But there are areas, at least in the Philippines, and I'm sure in, in, in Indonesia and in others, that even don't have access to this. How do we address this? See? So I think we should be aware of that, even in the way we handle education, etc. It's just a, a, a comment about how sometimes okay. some of these instruments well, the broken system, as somebody mentioned earlier, really reveals that we're talking all of this, but there are others who have been left behind. What do we do with this? Eh? So I think that's a very, very important question for public administration scholars within the context of equity. We're talking yeah. about not leaving others behind, but in reality, others are being left behind, not only uh, nationally, but even globally. I mean, come on, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, the difference between Korea and the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, etc. So I think we should always be aware of the digital divide that sometimes is actually being widened. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for your additional comments. I would like also to invite maybe later uh, Rosa and also uh, Masao to give comments on how is the critical factors to uh, 
to be successful in the digitalization of the governments and also society. So, Pagu, do you have any comments to the questions and also a feedback okay, just, from the? Okay, just let me focus on uh, on the central government and local government relations. Uh, COVID has challenged our policy making process. Uh, if we are talking about decentralization or local autonomy, can we, I mean, do central government officials trust local government officials to make policy when we realize that the competence, skills, level of education, financial resources varies from one area to another? We can compare from Jakarta to Papua, or western part of Indonesia and eastern part of Indonesia. We cannot just uh, assume that everything is fine there. The gap is very wide. We can see the technological gap, the technological divide. If we are talking about e-government or digitization, digitalization, we can see that Technology infrastructures, yes, uh, varies from one area to another. The internet connection is not uh, evenly distributed and adequate uh, speed uh, throughout Indonesia. We can see that the competence skills of public service uh, very low, and also the citizen readiness to participate in the technology based on service, uh, technology based services. That's the, our problem. So if we just rely on the policy at the government, uh, can we uh, like consolidate the policy uh, while the local officers or local leaders uh, only think of his uh, own regions? They have a silo mentality. That's the, the condition we, we are facing at the moment in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Agus. I think Indonesia is also re-centralized the authority yeah, from local government to central governments, yeah, uh, with some uh, laws. Yeah. For example, laws number, 20, uh, number 11, 2020, yeah. uh, Cipta Tenaga Kerja, yeah, creating labor, labor force. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, this is one of the fundamental reform where the re-centralization of the authority from local to central governments, and also additionally with the COVID, uh, COVID situations, yeah, so that the central government has uh, full power to decide the uh, mechanism, process, and system handle with the uh, COVID situations. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, I think eight or nine minutes. Uh, to the end of the talk show. I would give one more question to the participants. I, I see that Anna Victoria uh, raised her hand. Please, Anna. Uh, hello, good morning to good all morning. our speakers. Um, I'm Anna Victoria Borsiga from the Philippines. Um, and uh, I'm working with the Development Bank of the Philippines, but currently I'm studying at Songkyung Kwan University under the Program Directorship of Professor Rosa Cho. So um, what I, I just a comment maybe and not really a question, but uh, maybe one positive thing about the pandemic is the opportunity to accelerate digital transformation. And I think one of the most important uh, uh, element is also the strong commitment of the government alongside citizen participation. Because as, as Prof. Brilliant has said, that even still in the pandemic, there is a window for corruption, especially in the Philippines. So with the government's will and innovative leadership, its citizens will be motivated to do its part in digital transformation. So it will also allow us maybe to speed up e-government strategies now that we have seen during the pandemic that a lot of activities can be done digitally. But uh, still, uh, educating citizens is really a priority to allow progression of the transformation. So the government must formulate policies for said education like orientation, trainings, information dissemination about digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Pak Rudy, do you want to? Uh, so we have also a friend from Australia. I think we have uh, 
Dr. Sung Ho Kwon. Are you there, Ho? Do you want to say something or comments? Give comments? No? Okay. So there is also one question from Rian Nugroho. Uh, question to the uh, Dr. Cho. What are the key formal policies of the Korean government to respond to the pandemic in 2000, uh, 2020 until recently? It means, is there any law, act, presidential decision or other executive decisions uh, to manage COVID? Yeah. Also, please, uh, the comment of speakers. Rosa, do you want to start? Yes, why don't I, um, so I think this is kind of answering Rian's question too. So regarding, um, so the, I think the major policy uh, that was created following COVID-19 uh, yeah. was, I, I briefly mentioned it's uh, the Korean Digital New Deal. And so this was an attempt to try to revive the mm -hmm. economy uh, and actually making this crisis into an opportunity. Now, the, the, the digital divide in Korea for us, it's more about how, you know, we've all, we all teach online, you know, we were doing Zoom or whatever. And we, I'm sure everyone notices that the level of engagement or the level of kind of understanding and, and being able to actually absorb what we teach is very different widely across students. And that's why we're seeing much, much a larger educational gap forming, not at, only at the college level, but starting from primary school. And, and we, even in Korea, we're seeing this. And this is again, highly correlated with socioeconomic status where the disadvantaged population are falling behind. And this is a global uh, phenomenon. Now in Korea's case, this is also the case where, um, so I think moving forward for us, Korea, the, 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 you know, I think the policy setting and the vision, it's already set. We're moving towards, it's, our digital transformation is expedited, I think, much faster than we ever expected. I think we've moved maybe 10 years ahead of time because of COVID-19. Having said that, I think the question that we need to ask as public policy, public administration experts are, are we ready for this? Uh, Alex talked about the digital divide. Are we ready for this, really? How are we gonna deal with this? Secondly, is our um, government ready for it? I think simply think, thinking about this, you know how I said teleworking is now widely used in Korean government? Well, how are we gonna do performance management? Are government officials who are working at home, should they be you know, evaluated in the same way as officials who are on the ground outside because their job cannot be done at home? Because, you know, not all tasks can be done at home via teleworking. So there are, I think, these really integral questions that have not been addressed, even in Korea right now. Like, how are, you know, performance management issues? Like, and also, like, how are we going to motivate, keep morale high of public officials when they're at home? You know, th these are, I think, critical questions that have not been addressed yet. And so these are, I think, I wanted to have this as the kind of leaving question for us, all of us, moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, I give a time to Alex, Masao, and Pak Agus to give also uh, answer and also a closing statement. Yeah, since we are uh, at the end of the uh, talk show. Yeah. Oh, Please, uh, Alex. Who, Masao first. Yeah. Okay. Alex, could, could you 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 could okay. say? Yeah. Terima kasih. Uh, one reason why I started off with muddling through. It's really a notion of government. It's about incrementalism. But Beth and I had some kind of a side conversation here that it really is an opportunity also for innovation. At the same time, it's an opportunity to doing things the way they are. It's really up now to us in government. How do we do it? Or, you know, in public administration, is it an opportunity? Because, you know, we can just do things as they are all the time. But hey, we can also innovate. So incrementalism is really, uh, I guess, either doing business as usual or doing uh, some kind of... Uh, an opportunity for innovation. Number two, I, I agree with Rosa about that di digital divide. I didn't want to romanticize it. I'm sure you also have a variation of the digital divide. I mean, in, 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 in Japan, I know that there's a variation of the digital divide with the aging population, uh, for instance, right? I, I, I think that's, that's also. But you're also right, Rosa, about the fact that I think part of our job is really to develop our own capacities as far as this concerned. Uh, remote, I guess, the, the, I guess um, 
uh, removing the fear in us, ourselves included as far as that. So that's really something that's very, very important for us in the, in the business of quote unquote education and capacity building. And finally, I must mention, there are also some good and best practices out there. Uh, I, I, I think at the local level, in the Philippines, this, this for me is where the hope is. Eh? No? Sometimes national government doesn't really enable, but when you go down to the local level, there are so many innovations at the local level that national government hasn't even thought of. Local governments using digital, digitalization, using the kiosk, including addressing corruption. No, no contact between the public and, 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 uh, and the government. And I think that's great because it addresses the elephant in the room. There's always uh, opportunity for corruption. And, and, but again, I'll end by saying, you know, at the end of the day, how does one increase one's, or uh, I think the term would be, how does one develop this whole conscientization in us in public service? At least I'm, I'm speaking for uh, mm -hmm. the Philippines. You know, sometimes we forget that at the end of the day, we're not there for ourselves. It's for the public. Changing mindsets, and that is also a global thing. How does one change the mindset and behaviors of public servants, including including the people, our, our participants, our citizens? That, hey, you cannot leave the business of governance to government alone. We should get involved. It is, as one of, as one of my colleagues mentioned, the importance of shared responsibility. And that's what public administration is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Masausen. Thank you very much. Uh, our final other, uh, say, uh, you know, general observation is that uh, basically we have discussed the issue of the, uh, the public governance or PA uh, under the pandemic. But uh, uh, as the title tells us, uh, we can also discuss the post-pandemic, what will happen. Because Japan, a Japanese government will soon move toward to the kind of the, uh, the, the kind of exit of the pandemic uh, policy, try to coexist under the pandemic. That then, so the model of the, the government or the model of the policy is from under the, the uh, under the uh, kind of the uh, natural disasters to the new normal. That uh, th this kind of transformation we will need to again uh, discuss. We will need to have additional transformation of the public governance and its policy. And I think this is even more challenging uh, as because the PCR test or a vaccination uh, are all free. Uh, that means the government pay for it. But the, in uh, post uh, pandemic, uh, the government will ask the citizens to uh, pay the burden for so that again, or how to make how, how to make a kind of the uh, the. Uh, how to make a sustainable uh, policy uh, of the coexist with the pandemic in, in post pandemic, but also we will need to probably will need to discuss later. And yeah. of course, the situation may uh, differ, uh, different from one country to the other. So, but so the gradual will move to toward the discussion, we will need to discuss how to have a coexisting policy in post-pandemic. And uh, yes, and the digital divide is also important as Alex uh, uh, pointed out. Uh, in Japan, we had a digital divide uh, in, especially in the aged uh, the groups. But uh, uh, luckily that uh, because Japanese government had invested a lot of money to the infrastructures, so that uh, also the thanks to the scalable economy and the unit cost of the, the, the you know, the uh, smartphone and the PC is much, much, uh, you know, a lower than before. So that the able pupil now in, uh, in Japanese uh, the, the, uh, school, they have their own laptop and they can access to the online. Then uh, that will be a kind of the uh, additional, uh, the, the, that will open the, uh, the new occasion for them. And uh, related to the, uh, the because we have uh, Chair Agus, uh, Civil Service Indonesian Chair uh, Commissioner, and uh, as 
even my school that uh, this fall semester will 70% of the class will be conducted online while 30% will be conducted in face to face. And uh, almost two years have passed. That means that the students experiences their uh, half of the uh, student life experience studying in online will be a uh, job market. And how can the government can offer the, uh, the beautiful, uh, the, uh, you know, the job environment? And many students may, uh, pre uh, may prefer uh, work at home than work at office. Unlike in Korea, uh, in Japan, only 30 or 40 percent of the government officials can only have experiences work at home. Mm -hmm. So the majority is still the traditional style going to the office. And how can they uh, offer the better uh, uh, option or better opportunity as a destination, a career destination to the coming uh, generation who have experienced it, uh, the mm -hmm. online education? So that will be uh, uh, the additional challenge in coming years. Yeah. And, uh, thank you hey, very much. Thank you very much, Masao-san. Yeah. Bagus, can you give yeah. a closing statement? Yeah. I agree with uh, Rosa, I think, uh, with the current situation. Uh, how can we make sure that our employees, our public servants, still work uh, productively? And how can we measure? it? Of course, the mechanism for assessing employee performance should be changed, no longer just like uh, based on attendance, but also based on productivity. But it's not easy uh, to measure mm -hmm. uh, what is the clear output and so on. And the second one, uh, in the post pandemic, I think we can also question how many public servants is needed. So we keep the current size, or uh, we have to cut, and we have to cut how many? This is our uh, homework to make sure that the public servant, the size of the bureaucracy is uh, getting more efficient and efficient. And we have, of course, we cannot just keep the current size uh, while we have uh, new technology to make uh, public service delivery more efficient. Of course, we have to cut, but again, how should we cut? In the case of Indonesia, now we have 4.1 million people spreading out to uh, around yeah, 514 districts, 34 provinces, and 34 ministries. So we have to calculate again uh, hmm. the size of the bureaucracy. Thank you. Thank you, Bagus. Good uh, closing statement, I think. Yeah, we have to calculate also the impact of digitalization yeah. uh, on uh, reducing uh, rationalization of uh, civil settlement yeah, in that sense. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers and participants, I think the end of uh, our our uh, talk show is close is uh, closer this is the chinese proverb uh, when the wind of things blows some people build walls others build windmills so so you can uh, you can observe yeah. uh, which one do you do you choose to be uh, to be persons yeah to build uh, walls or build win, uh, windmills, I think. So ladies and gentlemen, I think, uh, I hope that we could always uh, strengthen our capacity and also uh, contribution to the development of uh, public admission study, as well as to the practice of public institution in delivering public services and managing complexity of governments. So we are going to organize a second talk show, maybe in, in the uh, Philippines will be also host uh, Alek yeah, or Lizan. Maybe we can, we can talk a uh, specific uh, issue like uh, policy development or uh, relations between central and local governments, or maybe also talking about the 
uh, engagement, involvement of the society and the stakeholder, yeah, and also maybe about the uh, digital governance, yeah, for post-pandemic uh, situation as uh, uh, proposed by uh, Mas Ausan, yeah. I think we have discussed uh, many things in this talk show, and I would like to uh, conclude some uh, issues that uh, digitalization of uh, governments uh, plays very important role in managing COVID. Yeah? Uh, and then there is also change and dynamics, the relations between central and also local governments. So in that case, I think uh, Korea are uh, more decentralized in a style of governments uh, in managing COVID. But I think Indonesia and also Japan's experience shows that the recentralization of authority uh, to be more effective in, in managing COVID-19. But also, as I mentioned before, uh, before the uh, digital transformation of the, the governments, also very important role and also a key success factors yeah, for the next development of uh, policy and governance uh, and public institutions. Yeah, not only in the managing COVID in that time, but also post pandemic and post uh, uh, post era of the pandemics. Yeah, to build. Uh, public institution, uh, new public institutions, yeah, and the governance. So I think this, this that's all what we have uh, discussed and talks today. I hope we could uh, learn each other, uh, share experience and also knowledge, and hope that we could also uh, contribute to the practices of public administration in uh, respective uh, respective countries. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the all speakers. Dr. Rosa Minyocho, Professor Alec uh, Brillante, uh, Masao San, and also uh, Pak Agus Pramusinto for very insightful ideas uh, and uh, explanations. We hope that we could meet in the second talk show of ACPA, uh, maybe in the uh, November this year, uh, and also uh, SKQ is organizing ACPA conference 2021. Uh, we are waiting for the announcements of uh, conference uh, for uh, call, uh, call conference. Yeah, uh, and last session of this talk show so will be the appreciation of certificate. Um, but Debbie, could you show the certificate for each speakers? Many hectares. Thank you very much for Agus Pramusinto. Yeah. Thank you. You are, you are certified now <laughs> as speakers. Thank you. Thank next. you. Next, next slide. Thank you. Professor Kuo <laughs> now you are certified as- Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, for Professor Alex Brillante. Thank you very much, Alex, for coming and being with us and share your experience. Terima kasih. You are now no, are no certified too, yeah, Alex, yeah? I like your signature. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And last, uh, for Professor Kikuchi Masao, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for being with us. I get okay. it. Thank you. I think we have to end this uh, talk show uh, and hope that you are uh, stay healthy at home and uh, after recovery of COVID-19, maybe we could uh, sometimes uh, offline meeting. Thank you very much. Very See much you much. in the next yeah. talk show. Thank you very much. Eko, there is no group photo, Prof. Eko. Oh yeah, group photo. Group photo, group photo yeah, group yeah. Photo. hey, Prof. Rosa, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> Okay. okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, guide for the group photos. We have nine pages in here. Wow, nine pages. <laughs> yeah. okay. but I don't know who, who will. Okay, it's only three on uh, the camera, so I think okay. we have enough time. Okay, for the first, uh, please uh, help me, uh, Maula, uh, to screenshot. Okay, three, two, one, say cheese. Cheese. Okay, next.
pages. Three, two, and keys. Okay, the, the third one. Three, two, and say keys. Okay, I think it's enough. We only have three pages. Uh, the video is on. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Eko. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Oh, see you then. Stay healthy. Thank, 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 Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Recording stopped.